again to yet another discussion for this week. So we've been looking at the title of the lesson which says the three cosmic messages. Which ones are these messages? These are the famous three angels messages. This is the message fit for people in their end time. And so we've been dissecting the first part of Revelation chapter 14 verse 6 to 12. In the last six lessons, and today we are going, we are still on that very a part of that, the first angel's message, which is in worshiping the Creator. So, first and foremost, we already saw that the hour of judgment has come. Yes, we saw the hour of judgment started um, at 1844, when also, which is simultaneous with it, the anointing of the, or not, not, not the anointing, sorry, but the cleansing of the sanctuary. So the sanctuary was cleansed in 1844 when Jesus moved from the holy to the most holy place. So right now he's standing for us in the holy of holies, uh, pleading our case to the almighty God, and so he covers us in judgment. This is why today's lesson is talking about worshiping that creator. Why should we worship? And what is worship in the first place? According to the dictionary, um, worship is a feeling or expression of reverence and adoration of a deity. It's part of a divine, it's a divine being or supernatural power. Somebody who's above us, that is worship. So now, why should we bother worshiping God? There are several reasons we come and see in the lesson. But then there are certain things, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, that we take for granted. One of these is the fact that we're still alive. When you wake up in the morning, you see the sun rising. You, in the night, you see the sun setting and the moon and the stars shining in the night. What does that tell you? When you go to sleep and you are able to sleep for 12, 8 to 12 hours in the night without any consciousness of what is happening around you and yet you are able to wake up in the morning as if you were still working what does that tell you do you take it for granted and think it just happens coincidentally not at all today we are looking at the fact that there is a master designer of everything that happens and that is a creator so this creator fashioned everything that we see today. The seas were created by him, the oceans, the plants, and we human beings were also created by, uh, by, by him. Both female and males were created by the creator God. So this creator is who we are studying today. We are talking about worshiping him. Since he made us, he deserves our adoration. He deserves praise and thanksgiving. And yet, there are some theories today that are opposed to the creationist view of our existence. One of them is the very famous evolution, which teaches that creation never just happened. There's no supernatural being behind the creation. Everything happened randomly from confusion and order, death and sin, struggle and, you know, the struggle for survival created things. This is not correct. We come and see, we want to see the reasons why evolution is actually not supposed to be talked about in the first place. It disapproves the very creator and it shows us as if we are a product of confusion, which is different. The Bible tells us we are wonderfully and fearfully made. God made us in a wonderful and fearful manner. And so, this is what we believe as Seventh-day Adventists. And indeed, every well-meaning human being should believe in that. So, one of the reasons we have to worship the Creator is that this Creator is a companion in tribulations. When you are in problems, there is that friend who sticks around. There is that friend who is around you. When you go to the book of Revelation chapter 1 verse 9, Revelation chapter 1 verse 9, this is the very last book of the Bible where Jesus appeared 
to John, the Apostle John, and he showed him some things that would prove very important for us today. So Revelation chapter 1 verse 9 says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and the patience of Jesus Christ who was in the aisle that is called the Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So John was there and Jesus was with him in the island of Patmos when he was when he had been you know exiled. We know all the disciples underwent a lot of tribulations. Some of them were killed, some of them were fried in pots of or boiling cooking oil. Some of them were crucified different dates. John was sent to the island of Patmos as a way to separate him from the other humans. So he lived there. And Jesus did not leave him alone. He was with him. John is also with us in spirit in the tribulations. He's our companion. Even Jesus was with him. So Jesus visited him. So here we are looking at it. This is a message of hope, okay, for every generation, but especially a message to prepare God's last day people for the coming of Jesus. The fact that Jesus is a companion in the, in the problems is the fact that we need to feel comforted in our own problems. But here we are not talking about self-generated problems. When you go to steal, and you get to be a court. Will Jesus proudly be with you? Well, he may, but it's not his obligation. You have been caught stealing, and you are facing the wrath of your problems. But when you are suffering for him, he definitely is with you. So we need to suffer in an innocent manner, suffering for him, or suffering for problems about which we really have no control. The central issue of revelation as a book is worship. There is a struggle for worship. There is a struggle for who should be magnified and revered. The world is full of problems. And so we have different people worshiping different things as you come and really see. So we need to worship the creator because he is it part and parcel of our problems. He is part and parcel of us and our problems. And he's willing and ready to make sure that we are protected in those problems. So now, Israelites had issues that we all know as Christians. We understand that the biggest problems that was in Israel is not uh, fornication, it's not adultery, it's not stealing, it is actually idol worship. They were selected to be a group, a peculiar group, that was supposed to be worshipping the Creator, the only one true God, like their motto says, the Lord is one, the Lord is one. And so we need to worship God. This God creator does not wish to be, to have a, an alternative God to him. He's a jealous God. He needs to be worshipped alone by the people that he created. And so, Revelation chapter 14 verse 7 then echoes something very important. Worship the creator who made the heavens and the earth. It's a reminder this is the one who is behind all the existence of everything that is there. It is a reminder that when most scientific and even Christian worlds have accepted evolution as something that should be, uh, as a theory that makes a lot of sense, there must be a set of people who are willing and ready to worship the creator, set apart to worship the creator. God is our creator. There are so many things we see. There are things we cannot even understand in the universe that he created. How big and amazing the sun is. The shining stars and galaxies in the, in the universe are too numerous to mention. 
the sun generates a lot of energy that we cannot generate even in all our activities that we have today. Our minds are too small to fathom, to understand, to grasp the idea that there is a God. So how do we respond? He's an awesome God. We need to give him glory. We need to, you know, worship him. He has unlimited power, and this unlimited power can only be appreciated by the word uh, worship, worshiping the creator. Another reason why we should worship the creator, besides him having created what is too mammoth, too humongous for us to understand with our small minds, we see a God who is close. He is a God who is close. He is interested in each one of us individually. He is both transcendent and immanent. Okay? He is both transcendent and immanent. Where do we get this idea that God is actually transcendent and immanent? We turn, turn, turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 17, we want to look at the transcendence of God. Is he closer to each one of us? Does he get intricate involved in our affairs? Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, For the flesh lasteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so they cannot do things that we would. So we shouldn't, you know, bother much about things of the world because they are not ours. Sorry, I read Galatians. So let's go to Corinthians. Sorry, pardon me. What I read was in Galatians. So Second Corinthians chapter uh, 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, and all things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He has been recreated. So this God is so close as to recreate us, to recreate us, to make us a flesh, a fresh, to make us a fresh, so that we are indeed close to Him. He is interested in our being. When we go hungry, this God is around. When we are struggling for tuition fees and school fees, this God is around. When you are complaining about a wayward husband or a disobedient wife, a non-submissive and abusive relationships, God is there intricately involved and he's willing that you actually have eternal life. So talking about his faithful, uh, his faithful followers, Jesus said, in them and you in me, that ye may be made perfect in one, and the world may know that you have sent me, and you loved them as you have loved me. According to John 17, verse 23. So Jesus is in us, and we are in him. That is quite intimate. And such a God deserves to be God, to be glorified and worshipped and adored. He promises again to remake us, to mold us, transform us into his likeness and his own image. That is very beautiful and understanding to have as a simple human being. Think about what that means. The God who created and who sustains the billions of galaxies is the same God who is the same God who not only in whom we live and move and have our being, but also works in us to give us new hearts, to purge us of sin. So he wants us to be as perfect as he is, as a way to help us out of the problems that we go through. So he's a God who is close. How do we respond? By worshipping him. That's all he needs. Worshipping and adoration. Then we see now, we want to look at some pros and cons of evolution versus creationism. The idea that the world appeared from nothing. Random appearance of the world. That is of evolution. A product of confusion and pandemonium and ending problems that resulted into beautiful beings like you and I, not at all. That cannot make sense. Well, the good news is we've been made and created by a holy God. This holy God 
created us. That is the creationist view. God spoke things into being and so they were. A supernatural being spoke things into being. Today, science has gone berserk. It brings out things that may not really be making a lot of sense. One of them is evolution. Unfortunately, some people have embraced evolution, Christians, and they have tried to amalgamate it, mix it up with it, the creation. They want to create one story concerning God and evolution. Can two work together unless they agree? Not at all. The light cannot mix with darkness. Evolution and creation are two opposing views. There is no way you can bring them together and create one sentence out of a combination of them. Now, amid the onslaught of this evolutionary thought, God has raised up a church, a people whose name is Adventist, looking forward to the coming back of the Messiah. They don't fear. This church, this group of worshippers, is concerned with the well-being of all human beings. And this is why they have a message to bring to you and I today to say worship God and the creator of the universe. Okay, so look at how closely tied Jesus and the creator, Jesus as a creator and Jesus as a redeemer are. He is a creator. He made everything. The Bible says, in him all things were made. And then he's a redeemer. The very creator came down on earth to die for the people who he had created and they got to sin, earning themselves a death sentence from the Father because of his impeccable justice system that cannot be bad, that cannot bend for any human being. But Jesus managed to die the death we are supposed to die. So he's our redeemer. So the moment, the moment that his role as creator is diminished by evolution or anything else, his role is a, as our redeemer also comes into question as well. Because they are intricately uh, linked. Jesus comes to redeem us from sin, from death, from suffering, and from violence. This is what we are redeemed from. And yet evolution says sin, death, suffering, and the violence are the very means of creation itself. A product of confusion. This cannot match. So these two cannot work together. Evolution and creation cannot work together because they are two different. One is on the North Pole, the other is on the, on the, on the South Pole, and they cannot meet. Mixing them is a big error. It's a dangerous lie. It cannot happen. And what makes it even worse is that evolution mocks the idea of Jesus' death on the cross. It mocks it. How? Paul inseparably links the introduction of sin by Adam to the death of Jesus. There is a link then between Adam and Jesus. Because Adam, after Jesus is sometimes referred to as a second Jesus, a second Adam, sorry. People died through Adam, but you have eternal life through Jesus. So in any evolutionary model, no sinless Adam could have introduced death because death, millions of years and death, was supposedly the force and power that was needed to create Adam to begin with. According to evolution, millions of violence, sinfulness, confusion, and so much pandemonium apparently led to the, crea to the creation according to evolution. But no, right from the start, evolution destroyed the middle of foundation of the cross. Seventh-day Adventists called the world to worship the creator and stand as a living witness against this era. So we are calling upon everybody to stand on the side of the truth. The truth that all what we see, the majesty 
that we see when you see a tree growing slowly and slowly and it becomes big with big branches bears the fruits and you eat it when you see rivers flowing to and fro pouring into the ocean when we see a child being conceived out of just a sperm and an egg thereby confusing to become one cell uh, and then divide, this cell dividing and becoming a big human being, a president, a preacher, or any ordinary human being, this actually causes us to fall on our knees and worship the one who is behind this one. It can't happen by mistake, not at all. It's not a product of confusion and pandemonium. It is a product of great design. There is an architect of this world and whatever is in it. So the gospel is indeed is the gospel is indeed the means by which judgment will come. Nobody will be judged without hearing the gospel. As in nobody will be condemned or set uh, or set alight or, or set aright uh, without any uh, gospel reaching to them. People will be judged according to what they heard. When the everlasting gospel comes to you, listen and be able to follow its promptings because the Messiah will not plead forever. Time will come when things will come to an end and then who will decide whether you are worth eternal life or not. Now, there is one amazing uh, final thought. The majestic thought that some creator, the one who created the heavens and the earth, actually left his majestic life in heaven to come and die on the cross. So the creator on the cross. How can a creator die? Why should he die? So, this should actually call for more reasons to worship God. We have already seen, but we are, we are, it's worth looking at, and looking at again and understanding that our Creator is also our Redeemer. The God who made us is the same God who redeemed us. Why? Because He sent His Son. Actually, the same Christ was, made, was in heaven during creation. He also came to redeem. The God who said, let us make man in our image according to our own likeness is the same one who on the cross cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. This is amazing news. Amazing news. A creator who also dies for his people. It's amazing indeed. Let us read the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 16. We hear what it has for us. Colossians, chapter 1, verse 16. In the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 16, and it says, For by him were all things created. By who? By Christ. Were all things created that are in heaven and are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all, cre all things were created by him and for him. This is Christ we are talking about everything was created for him and by him so this is one side of his his everything which was made was made for him and by him what about the other side of christ we see the book of philippians chapter 2 verse 7 to 8. philippians chapter 2 verse 7 says Philippians chapter 2, verse 7 to 8 says, uh, yeah, where is this? Philippians chapter 2? Philippians chapter 2, verse 7 to 8. I'm still looking at this. It's, uh, okay, it's right, it's here. Chapter 2, verse 7 to 8 um, of Christian says, but made himself. Let us start from verse, verse 4, I think. Verse 4, that's when we grasp the whole understanding. Look not every man to his own things, but every man also on the things of others. 
Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ. So what mind was in Christ? Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, and he humbled himself, and he became obedient unto death, even the death on the cross. Hallelujah. This one is amazing news. The creator, the one we saw in Colossians chapter 1 verse 16, in whom all things were made, and who was used, more like used to make all things, he has another side which is humbling himself even unto death and not to just simple death like being shot at or stabbed to death but death on the cross we all understand what or perhaps many christians understand what death on the cross means it is a humiliating death reserved for the thieves for the criminals hardcore criminals by the romans According to Roman measures, there is no one who deserves to die that death without being a criminal. But this, this Jesus, this creator, who made the heavens and the earth and everything they contain, did not want to remain with his honor in heaven, but left that heaven to come and die death on the cross, humiliating death. But who to, for whose benefit? You and I, the sinners. Because of this death, we saw that last time that he, death of judgment is good news. For we are covered in the blood of Jesus. We are covered in his death. And so, he is a creator on the cross. The first angel's message to worship the creator came after the cross after it had become known to the onlooking universe and Christ followers that the one who made heaven and earth, the, the sea and the springs of water is the same one who thought, who though being God took the form of a bond servant and came in the likeness of man, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. This is again something to ponder on. We are called to create, to, to, to worship this creator. No wonder heavenly beings worship him as well. As for us, redeemed by his blood, what else could we do but worship our creator and our redeemer? This is wonderful news. We need to worship the creator and the redeemer. We need to understand that this is amazing news again. Creator and Redeemer. Now, for, for foreign human beings like you and I, there is something that is spectacular. Once we come to terms with the message of the gospel, we need to realize that we, have, we exist for nothing else but to worship the Creator. Nothing at all. Whatever we do else is part and parcel, it's supposed to be part and parcel of worshiping the Creator. We need to draw again hope and comfort from understanding the immanence of God. The immanence is the idea that God is intricately involved in our affairs. This again calls for us to pray. To worship him through prayer for he is an ever present truest friend like the old song says ever present truest friend and because he is ever present truest friend we can open up to him however we want we don't fear anything because we worship him he knows us by name the bible says brothers and sisters that he even knows the number of hairs on our head so what or oh, what, what do you think you can hide from such a one? There is nothing at all. This gospel should give us peace that in this context 
we are saved. We are free. We are helped. He's near and closer to us, more than we can even think about it at our, our, ourselves. There are so many testimonies I personally can give about the closeness of God. He's been nearby me, intricately involved in my, in my affairs, in my education, my professional career, in my family. He's been closer. And so I am awed by the fact that he is closer. So I desire to worship him. I struggle, you know, to feel anything that separates me from worshiping this creator. It is difficult to feel that I can live without worshiping him. And by the way, if you could be wondering, human beings were made as worshiping beings. Every one of you, brothers and sisters, longs for some supernatural help. Yeah? You worship one or, one or another, another deity. But in the Bible, in the Christian Bible, we know that the battle is, is it to worship God, the creator, or to worship the devil? There are two entities fighting for the worship, worshipable throne. One is a creator. Another, the other one is, is a rebellious creature who chose a wayward way. And when he could not you know, create or a obedience unto the fellow angels alone when he could not get a throne that he, he needed to usurp the, 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 the seat of God he decided to come and mislead the, the other creatures created by God. This is where we are today. It is a fight. So God is calling you and I back to where he wanted us to be. He's calling us to say Quit the life of worshipping your money. Quit the life of worshipping your girlfriends. Keep the life of worshipping your boyfriends, your wives, your husbands. Quit the life of worshipping what you have made with your own hands. And worship the creator who made you. Don't worship technology and social media. No, worship the creator. Because he is the creator of the creator of social media. That should give you comfort to say, if I am worshipping God, I am actually on firm grounds. So may God help us to come to him and worship him. Remember, we can do nothing without him. We can only do everything through his enabling power, who is the Holy Spirit, given to us as help to be with us in times of trouble, in times of happiness, in times of sadness. This Holy Spirit is there and we ought to call upon him to help us worship the Creator. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you and glorify you for your love, your care, and your protection. Indeed, you deserve our glorification. Indeed, you deserve our, our, our desires to live with you. Indeed, you deserve our adoration, for you made everything from without. You spoke all of them into existence, including us. Help us to worship you in all angles of our lives, without any ounce of pretense, because we pray for everything in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. With a little thanksgiving in our hearts, we pray. Amen. See you next time. God bless you and keep worshiping the Creator.